There was the uh, there was a meeting this morning of the instructors for for 267. We got together. We were talking about okay, you know, let's get our exam problems all in. And uh, ah, I wrote a good problem, so they probably won't use it. Um, but uh, we'll see. But one of the things that came out was there was a little bit of fear. And they're like, oh, our students, our students, they're making mistakes. Now, of course, not all of them. You're the good students, because I can tell, because you're here. So we'll, probably the students who don't come are the ones that are making the mistakes. But I just want to tell you, it's better not to make mistakes. So if you're on an exam and you're choosing between make a bad mistake or not make a bad mistake, don't make the bad mistake. So I, I, I want to give an example of the kind of thing that was brought up. And uh, someone said, well, about like a third of the students couldn't do the following integral. So this is a challenging integral. e to the minus x dx. So about a third of the class got this wrong. OK, is there anybody brave enough to say, I think I know what this integral is. Oh, there's somebody who's like, I know what this is. What? So can you say that one more time? Negative e to the negative x. Well, maybe. Now, I'll put the plus c here. Maybe. Is it? Is it? Yeah, it is. This is right. Now, you're probably thinking, that didn't seem so hard, Steve. Surely, we'd all get the same answer. But apparently, here's some logic that people are using. And I use the phrase logic very loosely. What's the way to think of e to the negative x? 1 over e to the x. And people are like, oh, I've seen this game before. 1 over something when I integrate should be what? Yeah, natural log of something. But of course, natural log of something is just x. And so a large number of students think that the answer should be that. Now, let me convince you. It's not this. Here's how I convince you. What's the derivative of x? Is 1 the same as e to the negative x? No. No. Mistakes were made. So this is not true. Now, you're probably like, oh, good. He saved us one mistake. The thing is, you are so creative. You can make mistakes that we've never thought of before. It's amazing the kind of mistakes people come up with. So uh, why doesn't this work? Because there's probably somebody who is like, I'm still not convinced, Steve, even though I, I know it doesn't work. Why not? Well, when is it true that when you integrate something where you have a function downstairs, you do end up with natural log? Now, I've left a suspicious gap. What, what fills that gap? F prime. So it is the case that if you have a function downstairs and you have the derivative upstairs, then when you integrate that, you do get a natural log. But uh, be careful, because we want you to channel your inner Pokemon and get all the points. Got to get them all. Got to get them all. Don't lose your points by doing silly mistakes. Well, don't lose the points. That's, that's, that's a good strategy for the exam. All right, well, we need to get going. So where did we finish last time? So last time we talked about population models, and we finished with a particular population model, this one, which is called the logistic. And so as a reminder, this is p prime. And this came from sort of a, a simple setting where it says, oh, maybe our birth rate declines as our population grows. There's not as much uh, incentive to make more population if our population is already large. There's other ways to, to get to the same kind of scenario. And so that's what's being reflected here. This says, oh, birth rate declines as population increases, but our death rate stays more or less constant. And as I said, there's other ways to get to that scenario. And this has a solution. And we've derived it. And uh, if you forgot the derivation, or if you want to see it again, 
there's a video. Uh, go back and watch separable differential equations. Because we did it. This is a separable differential equation. So you do some separation, do some wonderful partial fractions. Life is good. And you get the following solution. P is this M, P0, divided by P0 plus M minus P0, e to the minus kmt. Now this P0, this stands for what? Do you remember? Yeah, the initial population. So you can think of it as the population at time zero. And uh, okay, so that's what we have. The M is part of the differential equation. And similarly, the K is part of the differential equation. And we're thinking this P as being a function of T. And if you plot this, uh, you have some scenarios. So if K is positive versus K is negative, you have some slightly different things going on. Now, one of the things is we have some really easy solutions. So what are easy solutions? Well, easy solutions are essentially constant solutions. And the way you find constant solutions is you set P prime equal to zero. You say, okay, that means I need P times this K times M minus P to equal zero. Well, there's two ways to do that. P equals zero or P equals M. So those are our sort of trivial solutions, constant solutions, we'll have another name for it in just a few minutes. And what happens if this K is positive, when you're between zero and M, so your population has something, it's not zero, but it's not yet up to this level M. And this, by the way, is called a carrying capacity, if you ever hear that phrase. The idea of it, it says, the environment which you're in can support so much population. And that's the amount of population that sort of the environment can s sustain. So between zero and M, you, you look and say, what can we say about P prime? Well, we have a positive, because K is positive. Population is positive, and M minus population is positive. So things drift up. So we drift upwards. We don't cross, we don't touch, we just move towards. And so as we get closer, we sort of start to level off. Similar, if we're above M, then we have positive, positive, negative. So we drift down, we move towards M. And okay, this makes sense because it says, hey, if we have some population, but our environment can help us sustain more, our population should increase. But if we have a population that's too large, larger than what the environment can support, we'll decrease. And that's what's going on. Now, if K is negative, you get slightly different behavior, but same sort of arguments. If I'm between 0 and M, I see that my population should be decreasing, so I move down. If I'm above M, I see my population should be increasing, and I move up. And I think in the, the book they call this something like doomsday or something, so I won't worry about that. Okay, so that's the, the model. So an example. So suppose that the population of a country in millions follows an equation. P prime equals K times P times 200 minus P. So in other words, we're in this setting. We see they gave us this 200. What does this 200 tell us? Just out of curiosity, how, how do we think of that? Carrying capacity is 200 million, right? So that says like the ideal scenario for this population, 200 million. All right. Its population in 1960 was 100 million and was then growing at the rate of 1 million per year. Predict the country's population for the year 2020. All right, so we have a couple of key things. Well, we have this differential equation. Great, so that means we're in this setting, which means we have a solution. All right, that's good. Now, there's some other pieces of information. Um, in 1960, we were at 100 million. How do we translate that into simple like symbols and, and representation of things. What is that telling us? Yeah, so this initial, was an initial population. So our P naught equals 100. And in particular, we're thinking of 1960. That's our time T equals zero. So our initial population is 100, because we're thinking of population as being in terms of millions. And uh, 1960 is when we start. We're also told that this was growing at the rate 
of one million per year. Now that seems important. They gave us the number. What can we get from that information? Yeah, so how do we know it's P prime? Is there any keyword? Yeah, we see rate. We also note that it does say growing, which says that it's positive. Sometimes they'll say declining at one million per year, which means, oh, it's a negative number. But here we see it's growing. That means it's positive. So we have P prime is zero is equal to uh, one. Except I don't know why I put my prime down there. Primes go upstairs. Okay, P prime is zero equals one. Good, good. And then it says, predict the country's population for the year 2020. Wow, 2020, so far off in the future. Who knows what life will be like in the year 2020. Okay, so let's begin. Let's use P prime zero equals one. Using P prime zero equals one, what can we find? What does that help us get? Okay, okay. So we have uh, one equals P prime of zero. So now I'm gonna say, well, what is that? That's K, actually I can point to this one, times the population at time zero, times 200 minus the population at time zero. But we know things. Population at time zero, 100. So we get 100 times 200 minus 100. Or if you like, that's K times one with a bunch of zeros. K times 10,000. All right, so now we're actually in great shape because if you look, we have all our pieces that we need. We've got our, our M, we have our P0, we have our K. So we're ready to write down our equation. Say, look, we know what our population is at any given time. And uh, here we go. So our population at time T, okay, so that's going to be M times P0, so M is 200, P0 is 100, divide by P0, 100, plus M minus P0, 200 minus 100, and then it's going to be E to the minus K, that's 1 over 10,000, times M, which is 200, times T. Now we can clean this up a little bit. For example, 200 minus 100 is 100. So there's 100 here and 100 here on both the terms in the denominator. I can factor it out and cancel with the 100 upstairs. So that would be effectively canceling these pieces here. So we can say, all right, another way to write this is as 200 divide by one plus E. Now here, 200 over 10,000. Well, we can knock out some zeros. So it's really like 2 over 100, which is the same thing. 2 over 100 is the same as 1 over 50. So E to the minus 2 over 50. All right, so there's our equation for our population at any given time. Now we want the population in the year 2020. What does that mean for us? So do we plug in 2020 for T? No. no? Aren't we supposed to find the year 2020? Yeah, remember what our time, we had this time shift. So time zero is 1960. So what does time, well, what does 2020 correspond with? Yeah, so 60. So this is, in other words, at time equals 60. So the population after 60 years, which is what we're after, will be 200 over 1 plus E, and 60 over 50, we can write that as 6 over 5. And there we go. Now, uh, if we wanted a, a decimal answer, this would be a great time to pull out our calculators. I think, if I recall, this is about 153. 0.7, maybe, yeah. is, anybody, is that right? Ah, cool, I can remember things. Like for example, 
I remember the integral of e to the minus x. <laughs> so, now, at this stage, what do we do? Yeah, we put a box around it. But what should we do? As we put this box very slowly, what's going through the back of our head? Someone said, it's a nice box. Well, well thank you. I, I did take a drawing class when I was in college. It was a great class. I, I love the instructor. He had this wonderful accent. Um, and he, he told us at the very beginning, you know, he said, I, I, he came from, I, I think it was Senegal. He said, I do not believe that you cannot become good artist, but I do believe you cannot become good draftsman. And I was like, oh, yes, that's the spirit. It, you know, look. I may not be an artist, but I can at least draw a box. <laughs> That's me. That's what I can shoot for. Um, so one of the things we should do in the back of our head is say, is this a reasonable answer? Now suppose we had gone to this point and the, our number came out as 322. Now you probably would say, I'd just circle that, Steve, and I'd walk away. But should we circle an answer like 322 in this case? Why not? It's not reasonable. Why isn't it reasonable? It's above the carrying capacity. We can't go up above the carrying capacity. You know, we should think about, you know, things like that. What if we'd got an answer like two? Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Our population should be going up towards the carrying capacity because that's how we know the model works. But I've seen students do things like this. I, I, I taught trigonometry once, and there was a problem about how tall is a mountain. And one student got an answer of 10,000 miles. And they said, yeah, that sounds great to me. And they circled it, and they moved on. Now, for reference, Everest is like seven. So 10,000 is not reasonable. So anyways, it's good to think about, is it reasonable? If you go back to the model, you can even say, well, look, we know we start halfway between 0 and m, because our population is 100, m is 200. So it's like we're starting halfway. And so we should expect to be going up, but we should also expect to be having our rate slow down a bit. So we were at 1 million per year. We've had 60 years of growth, but our rate should go down. So we should be a little less than 60 million in terms of our increase. And it was 53.7. So. Yeah, reasonable, reasonable. All right, good. That, in case you're wondering why, why there was a beep there, that's the AV system saying, are you still there? Yes, I'm still there. All right, so we are done with our discussion about population. At least I think we're done. Any questions? OK. So we're going to switch gears into a new topic. And we're actually going to use what's on the screen to get us going. Now, this model is about population. So it doesn't make any sense to have population be negative. But why should that stop us from drawing pictures? So we could say, what happens if population is negative? Well, let's just think about it. So if I'm down here, population is negative. I have a positive, a negative, positive, which means that my population goes down so that my population would be doing something like this. Now that's assuming k is positive. If k is negative, that flips the sign around. And so our population would be going up. And so it would be doing something more like that. Now when we look at these diagrams, we sort of see kind of two interesting phenomena happening. And I'll mark them. So when k is positive, and we look near p equals m, or when k is negative and we look near p equals 0, we say, hey, what's happening? If I'm near m and I move forward in time, what's going to happen to my population? So I start nearby, what happens? Well, it, it gets closer, right? It's converging towards m. So somehow, it's, it says, oh, if I'm near M, M is the right thing. I move towards it. Or down here, where K is negative, it says, oh, if I'm near zero, 
move closer to zero. On the other hand, we have this other interesting point where it's either zero, where k is positive, or it's m, where k is negative, and it says, well, look, if I'm zero, I stay zero, but suppose I'm just a little bit away from zero. What happens? As I move forward. I move away. I'm, I'm repelling things, you know? So there's sort of like push away. So there's this sort of two phenomenon going on. And so we want to talk about this. We're going to give names to these things. So we start by saying we have this notion of something called an autonomous differential equation. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, autonomous basically means it's, it's self-driven. And so it's uh, the form y prime equals f of y. What's missing? Yeah, there's no like x or no, there's no t. It's all essentially self-referential. So I, I don't have this external variable. It's, it's, I'm understanding the differential equation as just how does things change in relationship to the variable itself. And now we come to the idea that says, you know, it can be hard to find solutions. Even here, that takes work. If you don't believe me, watch the video. It does, it takes work, and that's simple. But the nice thing is, even if we can't find the explicit solution, we can understand how the solution should behave. And so we're after, uh, it says here, and a little bit later on, basically understand the qualitative behavior. So there's sort of this notion of quantitative versus qualitative. Quantitative says, oh, I can compute the explicit function and then I can get numbers, life is good. Qualitative says, what's the behavior? Can you get some essence of what's going on? And so that's what we're after. And so how does this work? Well, we say, look, everything's driven by y. So what we do is we say, let's find what we call critical points, where f of y equals zero. Well, okay, f of y equals zero, that tells us that that means that y prime equals zero. So when we find critical points, what we're really finding are solutions to the differential equation where we have y equals a constant. Because the derivative of a constant is zero. And when we plug that constant into the function, we get zero, zero equals zero. So in terms of our logistic model, our constants are m and zero. So that's our critical points. And you say, okay, great. Well, you found those. Those are the nice solutions. What do you want to do? Well, we want to understand the behavior. We really want to capture the behavior of what's going on around things. So we're going to introduce this notion of something called the phase diagram. And the goal of this is to, to capture behavior. Now, there's a couple of ways to, to think about what's going on. So let me do some graphs here. Uh, so I'm going to graph y and y prime. So I'm going to be careful here as I label axes so there's no confusion. Do you, should we start with the logistic model so we can start with things that we're comfortable with? Yeah, we'll start with that. Okay. So suppose we had the differential equation, and we'll just make k equal 1, just to make things easy. y prime equals y times 10 minus y. All right. So what we're after here is we want to capture behavior. And, and the way we do this is we say find, find the zeros. So where does y times 10 minus y equal 0? 0 and what? 0 and 10. So those are essentially like the roots because they're the roots. Now, I can think of this as a, as a picture, right? Because I have y, y prime, and I have y prime as a function of y. What does this picture look like? What is it? What kind of graph is this? 
quadratic. So we have a name for that. Polynomial. Well, yeah, it's a polynomial. It's a really special kind of polynomial. It starts with the P, if that helps. Parabola. parabola. Is it a parabola that opens down or that opens up? How can you tell? Yeah, you look at the y squared term, and what's the coefficient? It's a negative 1. So the negative in front of the y squared tells us it opens down. Now, this is not the phase diagram, not yet, but we're about to get to the phase diagram. So what we're going to do is we're going to just take this and actually just simplify and say, OK, we're going to take our y. We are going to mark where we have our zeros. So far, so good. Nothing too surprising. And now what we're going to do is we're going to say, let's look at y prime. So what can we say about y prime between 0 and 10? It's positive, because we can see it. Between 0 and 10, it's up. So y prime is positive. Uh, above 10, what's true? It's negative, because it's, it's down. And by the way, if you can't graph this picture, you can still answer these questions by saying, if I know where the zeros are, I can test. I just pick points and see what's the sign. And OK, below zero, negative again. Now what's happening, and you might be saying, boy, Steve, this is feeling really familiar. It almost feels like we're doing some kind of stuff from Calc 1, like a first derivative test, because we kind of are. Y prime being positive tells us what's the behavior for Y? Is Y going up or down? Yeah. Where the derivative is positive, we go up. Y prime negative, do we go up or down? Down. And down. So this right here, this is what we call the phase diagram. And what it's telling us is it's telling us, OK, in between our critical points, do our curves go up or down? And now we can classify critical points. We say, OK, what kind of critical points do we have? Well, we say we have something which is stable if solutions nearby drift towards the critical point. In other words, we move closer towards the critical point. So are either of these two points stable? 10. Yeah, so the key here is you look for the arrows coming both in. So where the arrows both come in, that says stable. All right. A critical point is unstable if solutions nearby move away. Is either of these unstable? Yeah, zero. Zero is unstable because the arrows move out. We're moving away from it. So if, I, if I'm not exactly at zero, see, if I'm exactly at zero, where do I stay? I stay at zero. But if I'm at 0 0.00001, whew, I move up to 10. At least I move towards 10. Now, the last one is a critical point is semi-stable if it's stable on one side and unstable on the other. Now, are either of these semi-stable? No. But you can imagine you have something like y prime equals y squared. OK, in that phase diagram, where's our critical point? It's at 0. Below 0, is y prime positive or negative? So if I plug in, if I plug in a negative value for y, I square, so I get a positive number. If I plug in a value, positive value for y, I square, I get a positive number. That says we go up and we go up. So this would be something that's semi-stable. Now, the other configuration might be something where we have down and down. And you can see that y prime equals negative y squared as an example. All right. So these are the examples. So now we can understand the behaviors. But we can actually translate these into pictures. And the way we translate them into pictures is we do what we had for the logistic curves. We mark where our constant solutions are. And then we say, look, 
Do we go up between the curves or do we go down between the curves? And that tells us what to draw. And is that precise? No, there's flaws. But does it capture the behavior? Yes. Yes, it does. And it gives us a good intuition of what's going on. All right. Well, are you ready to try it? OK. So for the differential equation, y prime equals y squared times y minus 2 times e to the y minus 2, find all of the critical points, classify each critical point, and that means stable, unstable, semi-stable, draw the phase diagram, and do a rough sketch of some typical curves. And we're like, wow, there's a lot to go on in just this one problem. This is great. Now, the first comment to make is when we look at this differential equation, y prime equals y squared y minus 2, e to the y minus 2, our, I would say that this differential equation falls into the category, uh, meaning hopeless, hopeless. We can't solve this quantitatively. We're not going to find the function that does this. So that's why we say, but we still want to understand it. So that's where this notion is coming in that helps us understand things that are going on. Um, OK, so where to begin? Probably where it tells us. Yeah, find the critical points. So to find the critical points, we take our function, y squared times y minus 2 times e to the y minus 2, and we set it equal to 0. OK, so where are some choices for y uh, where this is true? OK, people know it's 0. Any others? 2, OK. Any, anything else? Oh, natural log 2, cool. Now, the, the question. How does natural log of 2 fit in amongst 0 and 2? Obviously, 0 is below 2. We know that. We're pretty convinced of that. But where does log 2 fit in? Is it bigger than 2? Is it below 0? Is it in between? Are you sure? Now, some people are like, no. It's OK to be like, I don't know. I don't memorize log 2. Ah, you innocent kids these days, you know. <laughs> Back in the days of your, your grandparents, they memorized log 2. They were like, I will have this memorized. Uh, because you had to know it. So if you're not sure, this is a great time for a calculator. But if you didn't have a calculator, you could do some reasoning here. So for example, is log 2 positive? Can we say that? Yes. Yeah. Log 2 is positive because anything that's bigger than 1 when you plug it into log is going to be a positive number. So it's got to be above 0. Now, we can compare log 2 to log of other numbers that we know. So for example, e is a nice number when it comes to log. e is 2.71828. Natural log of e is what? 1. Natural log of 2, how should that compare to natural log of e? Should be less than 1, because log is an increasing function. If we put all that together, that says log 2 is somewhere between 0 and 1. So good news is we can at least sort these. So there's a 0, there's a log 2, and a little bit further out here is 2. So those are our critical points. Now you see it says classify each critical point. Before it says draw the phase diagram, but I would recommend swapping the order there because the phase diagram will help us to understand what's going on. We have three critical points. That has split up our line into four parts. So we now need to understand each part. All right, so we begin. Well, uh, there's lots of ways to do this. Uh, but generally, a good strategy is to say, plug in some points. We know at these values that y prime equals 0. And so we can just say, test anywhere in between. And uh, because, regardless of it, so see, if I have a point 2, if I pick 3 or 5 or 100 or a million, it's all going to have the same sign. And that's what we care about, the sign. Because we saw the sign, and it's going to open up our eyes when we see that sign. So that's what we're after, it's a sign. 
Okay, so let's maybe start above two. Any number above two that you like? Three. That's fine. So we're plugging into y prime. We just care about the sign. Okay, y squared will be positive. Y minus two? Positive. E to the y minus two? Put it all together? Positive. So that says y prime is positive. Okay, something between log two and two. One. We, we, we even had that discussion. Okay, one squared? Positive. One minus two? Negative. E to the one minus two? Positive, because that's E minus two. E is 2.7, dot, dot, dot. So put it all together? Negative, yeah, because it's positive, negative, positive. Okay, something between zero and log two. Now you're like, ah, ah. Well, we can put in something, how about 0 0.00001, sure. right? So for, that's like an engineer zero, but it's positive, right? Okay, just slightly above zero, y squared positive or negative? Positive, y minus two positive or negative? Negative. E to the 0 0.0001 minus two? Yeah, because like, that's e to the zero, right? We're engineers, we just round. That's one minus two, that's negative. Okay, so we put it all together, what can we say about y prime? Positive, positive. good. All right. Finally, something below zero. Negative, negative one, yep. Negative 100, okay, y squared? Positive. Y minus two? Negative. Either y minus two? Negative. negative. Put it all together? Positive. So, we now know the sign. So we almost have the phase diagram. We just say, okay, what do the arrows tell us? When I, we see y prime positive, do we go to the right or to the left? Yep, to the right, to the right. When y prime is positive, we draw to the right. Wow. <laughs> okay, if y prime is negative? Yeah. To the left, to the left. Yep. You didn't know that, but you know, Beyonce is all about orientation. Okay, good. So we're now ready to classify. So let's do that. Let's do our classifications. What can we say about this point zero? What kind of point is it? Semi-stable. Semi -stable because the arrows point in the same directions. How about log two? Stable, because we're moving towards log two. How about two? Unstable. Isn't that easy? This classifying stuff is good. And it's wonderful, because we don't even have to solve any integral problems. Ah, our favorite part of, of a class about integration, when we don't have to actually integrate anything. Okay, so we're not done yet because you have to do a rough sketch of typical curves, but we say, look, there's three curves which are we can absolutely graph perfectly. What are the three curves we can graph perfectly? Sorry, what? Yeah, these, Critical points are actually curves. These are valid solutions to the differential equation. So y equals zero, y equals log two, y equals two. All right, now we just remind ourselves what's gonna happen. So we can just take this diagram and turn it sideways. And so we're gonna be going up, and we're gonna be going down here, gonna be going up, gonna be going up. So, you say, look, if I'm above two, we should go up. So we should start and head up. And that'll be the diagram. From two to log two, we're gonna be going down. So we say, okay, we're gonna start at two and move towards log two. Now we don't cross log two, we don't even touch log two, we just move towards log two. But that's okay. And there we go. Between zero and log two, we go up. So we start at zero and we move upwards. And this is us being very rough. Of course, you can imagine, well, yeah, maybe these are slightly steeper, slightly shallower, but we're capturing the essence. Below zero, we go up. And so we approach. 
And there we go. That is a rough sketch because we understand where the constant solutions are and then we can say what's happening in between. Now, a question. If I take my diagram and I were to shift the curves ever so slightly to the left or to the right, the picture should stay the same. Can you see why? You might just say, you drew it that way, Steve. But there's, there's a better reason for it. Why does it, when we shift it a little bit, does it say, yeah, that still works? Yes, that's what it comes back to. See, when we're talking about this kind of classification, we have something autonomous. Y prime only depends on Y. So there's no effect of X. So that says, hey, if you just change your starting time, say from time zero to time two, it's still gonna be the same diagrams. And that's why it'll be invariant under this shift. All right, good. Any questions on this one? Are you ready? All right. Now, I like this problem. You might like it too. I hope I can convince you that it's good. What can we say about the behavior of the critical points for y prime equals hy minus y cubed for various values of the parameter h? Now, this is a different kind of a problem. We still have critical points, so we're still talking about classification. It's still the same section. We haven't switched sections yet. But the sort of the different idea here is we don't have a differential equation. Instead, what we have is a whole family of differential equations. Many, many differential equations because we can choose a value for h. And depending upon what value for h we use, we're going to get different behaviors. And so our goal here is to say, well, what can we understand about the critical points and how does it change with H? So this is getting more into sort of dynamics and uh, which can be fun and can also be slightly confusing, but hopefully we'll focus on the fun. All right, well, let's start by talking about the critical points. So can we say anything about our critical points? So remember that's y prime equals zero. That means hy minus y cubed equals zero. What can we say about our critical points? Okay, someone says there's a critical point at zero. How did you get that? You can factor out a y. So y times h minus y squared equals zero. Okay, so I agree with the y equals zero is a critical point. Where's the other one? Square root of h, that's it. Plus or minus square root of h. Are you sure? Are you sure? Steve says, as though to imply that there's some subtlety here. Remember, h can vary. If h is negative, Yeah, we get into that. We, it depends on what h does. So this will work as long as h is greater than or equal to zero. If h is negative, we only have the one, the one critical point. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're gonna sketch a diagram, no surprise, but I want to point out this is going to be different from the diagrams we've already sketched. And I'm going to put H here on this axis and Y on that axis. And so we have some <coughs> critical points. We'll sketch them in. We have zero is always a critical point. But then we also have this plus square root of H and this minus square root of H. So our goal is to understand the behavior of these critical points. Now, the way we're going to do this is we're gonna take a look at the behavior at a couple of different times and just say, okay, what's happening? 
And in particular, what seems to be an interesting choice for H? I would say something interesting happens at zero. So let's take a look at H equals zero. Let's also look below zero. What's a nice number below zero? Negative one seems to be a, a relatively nice number. And we'll look at something above zero. Two. Two. Whoa. How about four? <laughs> now the reason, I was gonna go with one, but you were like two. I was like, okay, well let's go up not one. But the reason I want four is I like square root of four better than I like square root of two. Not that I don't like square root of two. Square root of two is a nice number, but for my purposes, I'm trying to keep things easy. All right. So if we were to, to draw our diagrams where we had before, where we had the y and the y prime, well, when h equals zero, we have zero minus y cubed, because that just goes away. So it looks like a y cubed function just turned upside down. So in terms of our state diagram, or sorry, phase diagram, what's happening? Are we, what can we say about this point? Stable, unstable? So we've had some people say unstable. We've had some people say stable. Some, now we have some semi-stable, so it's like, okay, this is cool. It's one of those three. We've narrowed it down to all three possibilities. <laughs> y prime below zero is what? Positive or negative? Positive. So that says we are going up. Y prime above, negative, so we're going down. So are we stable? Okay, now, come over here. H is negative one, minus y minus y cubed. In the interest of time, uh, I'll, I'll tell you, it looks like this. So w the difference here is, is if you look at the tangent line at this point, it's, it's a flat tangent line as you pass through zero. Here it's a slightly steeper tangent line. That's the, the, essentially the only difference. All right, we have one critical point, still at zero. What kind of critical point is it? Yeah, it's still stable. Okay, at h equals four, if we come through and draw our diagram, it has the following, because there's three roots. There's a root at two, at zero, and at minus two. So it's not too hard to find those roots, and then it's not too hard to draw the diagram. So, what can we say? What kind of point is two, stable or unstable? So, before two, we're positive, which means we're going up. After two, we are negative, which means we go down. Between zero, whoops. How did negative two become positive two? That's strange. I lost my orientation. More Beyonce for me. All right, between zero and positive two, we are positive, which means we're going up. Uh, above positive two, we're negative, which means we're going down. So negative two is stable. Zero is unstable. Two is stable. So I guess this is very sus. I guess that's a word people use. Um, <laughs> But, put this all together, we can say, look, there's an interesting change here. So we're stable over here and up through the origin. And then what happens on the other side? Where, does our, where do our stable points lie? Yeah, so they, they lie. So what you should be thinking of, and this requires some mild imagination, just mild, just slightly, is that this picture right here 
came from tra taking this and turning it sideways. So that this is 2, 0, minus 2. So which parts, which, there's three prongs here. Which ones are the stable parts? Yeah, the top and the bottom. So these are stable. And then the unstable is here. Un, da, 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 da. And so now we have a, a com really a complete characterization of what's happening with the critical points. We can say, okay, for H negative, there's one stable point, uh, including H equals zero. For H positive, there's two stable points and one unstable point. And you can actually go even a step further because what's happening is, if we can see the following, uh, namely, we can understand how Y changes. So Y is coming up in the regions here, it's coming down on the inside, going up here again, and it's coming down again. So you can even see the flow of Y, and you can add that to your picture if you wanted to. So th there's lots of interesting things that people talk about when it comes to sort of dynamical systems, when you have these extra parameters floating around. How do things change? There's uh, this notion of bifurcation. Uh, dynamical systems, chaos, all comes to things like this. All right, based on the amount of time, I think this is a good place to stop, and we'll pick up again next time.